que a, a Judith Prochaska tem, ela é PHD, vice-diretora, professora titular de medicina na Stanford Cancer Institute, né, entre os inúmeros títulos que ela tem, ela é fellow e foi presidente da Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco. Seu programa de pesquisa tem alavancado tecnologia para trazer tratamento do tabagismo em populações que têm aumento de prevalência, inclusive transtorno mental, né, tem pouco acesso e muita prevalência de tabagismo, né, são aqueles exilados e que têm pouca voz, então nós temos que ser as vozes dele deles, porque o tabaco acaba sendo uma camisa de força sutil, né? cala a boca e eles aceitam a morte precoce com isso, cerca de 25 anos antes da maioria das pessoas, o que é um absurdo, né? e é, também tem contribuído para capacitar, faz, é, estimular a educação em saúde e na prática clínica dos profissionais que atendem esses pacientes, que historicamente foi enviesado pela indústria do tabaco. Ela já publicou mais de 250 artigos peer-reviewed né, e faz parte do editorial board do JAMA Internal Medicine, né, que é uma revista maravilhosa, grandiosíssima, e contribuiu com a última edição, muito famosa e muito referenciada, muito é, aclamada do Surgeon General é, de 2020. The word is with you, Jody. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so very much, Carol. I, I wish I understood Portuguese. I could understand what all you said, but I very much appreciate the lovely introduction and am thrilled to be with you here today uh, for World No Tobacco Day. And I'll be presenting on smoking cessation among people with mental illness. And I'm coming to you from Stanford, and that's our building there. Uh, next slide, please. Let me just... Okay. Oh. Just a second. Oh my God, just a second. Are you listening to me? Because I think it's here. I'm listening. There we go. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> you got a little bit of a preview there. So yeah. the model that we'll use in, in talking today is the have model. Uh, This is a model that's used in infectious diseases and is, for example, used when considering malaria that's delivered the parasite malaria through the vector, the mosquito, to the host, the individual. And we'll take that model and consider it in relation to the tobacco industry. And our host will be people with mental illness. Our um, agent will be tobacco addiction, cigarettes. Our vector will be the tobacco industry. And then the E is the environment and we'll consider the mental health treatment environment and the ways in which that may have served to continue tobacco use in this population and how it can be leveraged to provide treatment to help people quit smoking. Next slide. So the problem of tobacco, as I've said, uh, that smoking occurs in high prevalence among people with mental illness, uh, they would be the host that cigarettes are addictive and deadly, and that would be the agent, that the tobacco industry has targeted people with mental illness, and that's the vector, and that mental, treatment, mental health treatment settings have a history of permitting smoking and failing to treat tobacco use. Uh, that's the environment. And we'll talk about how that can be reversed to uh, now provide treatment effectively. These data here are from the US, and so I'm, I'm happy to provide our experience in the US uh, to see how it may be helpful for the work that you're doing in Brazil. And what we've seen in the US is a very consistent, elevated uh, prevalence of tobacco use among those with mental illness, highest among those with current mental illness, but also elevated among those with a history of mental illness compared to people without mental illness. And these different bars, that the, the blue are the bars for people with current mental illness. And you can see those are the highest in every example. Uh, and then you can see that over time, those rates of tobacco use have remained very high among those with current mental illness. Uh, the next slide is very recent data um, and it's from 2000, um, 
2022, and it's looking specifically among people uh, with uh, major depressive disorder in the past year. And that's that green line, the top, the top um, line with the green circles. And what's hopeful and optimistic is that that line is sliding down. Uh, so the smoking prevalence among people with past year major depressive disorder has declined. And what's also hopeful is that the difference between those with major depression and those without mental illness uh, has started to come together. So the difference between those groups has declined. So the disparity that we see in tobacco prevalence among those with major depression uh, has um, shrunken some over time. Yep. The next slide. Uh, these are older data, but they're helpful because they show uh, that we see higher smoking prevalence in just about every psychiatric category. Uh, so whether it's schizophrenia or psychotic disorders, uh, unipolar depression, bipolar depression, substance use disorders, anxiety disorders. Uh, if you have those disorders currently, you are more likely to smoke. Uh, if you had those disorders in the past, you're also at elevated risk for smoking uh, relative to people without mental illness. Then the next slide. What we see here is that we see greater prevalence of use across all tobacco product categories among people with serious psychological distress. Uh, so that's true for any tobacco use, cigarettes, cigars, pipe or hookah, e-cigarettes, smokeless tobacco, uh, and then also dual use, use of more than one tobacco product at a time. Next slide. So we'll spend just a, a moment looking at this agent, this the cigarette, which we probably all know and think we know what's in this thing. Um, but many people who smoke are, are not fully aware of the design of that cigarette and that it's been designed to create and sustain addiction. And by creating and sustaining addiction, it then guarantees the tobacco industry of, of a lifetime consumer uh, and making quite a bit of money off of these individuals. Uh, so nicotine, um, people nowadays tend to know that nicotine is the drug in cigarettes that makes it so hard to quit. Uh, but what they may not know is that the tobacco industry has titrated, has manipulated levels of nicotine uh, to make it you know, optimally addictive. Um, the cigarette is designed to, to bring the smoke into the mouth and then deep into the lungs to rapidly get nicotine to the brain. Uh, and there are aspects that are put into the, into the cigarette to make it easier to inhale so that the smoke is not as harsh. Um, these include bronchodilators, um, levolunic acid, sugars, uh, and the sugars can also um, create greater addiction by interacting with the nicotine. Um, there's filtration, there's ventilated filters in the cigarette that allows side stream air to come in. Also again, um, to, to let, make it less harsh the smoke, and then also allow the individual to suck harder to get the nicotine and the carcinogens deeper into the lung tissue. Um, there's also flavorings added to cigarettes like, like chocolate, licorice. Um, and then we also know that there's uh, tobacco specific nitrosamines um, in the tobacco and those are carcinogenic. Ammonia is, uh, is added to most cigarettes and that um, speeds the, the time at which nicotine reaches the brain when it's smoked through the cigarette. So that's the agent. The next slide is our vector, and that's the focus on the tobacco industry. And so the next few slides will we'll look at what the tobacco industry has done uh, to market and target two individuals with mental illness. The first two um, pictures here on, on this slide are examples of ads um, the one on the left um, promoting this idea that smoking will help um, your personality, will calm you out, has psychological effects. Um, the other is an ad that I found in the industry documents um, that has that headline schizophrenic at the top, um, language used by the tobacco industry, um, and talks about how with merit cigarettes, they're low tar but big on, on flavor, and so it's got this double personality, and again, aligning it kind of with, with a mental disorder. The next slide. When I did um, some research, and this is for an article that's mentioned here, uh, published in 2008, I was looking at the extent to which the tobacco industry has fueled this idea of self-medication, 
uh, that people with schizophrenia need to smoke in order to, um, uh, to medicate their symptoms of mental illness. And what I found, and these are, these are previously secret documents that are available online to be able to search. And they've been obtained through litigation. So they were previously hidden. And now scholars can, can look at what the industry has, their conduct, and then also what they've known. Um, so I found 28 proposals that were submitted to the tobacco industry. And they funded seven. And all seven that they funded focused on this self-medication hypothesis. Uh, the patients with schizophrenia needed to smoke to manage their, their symptoms. There were 21 unfunded proposals, and those tended to focus on the high smoking prevalence in this group, the health harms that were being seen among these individuals, and nicotine withdrawal effects. And for some of those uh, proposals, the industry questioned, well, maybe we could change their hypotheses. Um, they've got access to patients, and, and maybe we could make use of their, of their samples to focus on something other than health harms for example. Uh, the next slide shows one of the proposals that was funded and it was from an investigator in Canada um, and it was focused on tobacco smoking as a coping mechanism in psychiatric patients. And the investigator, as you see there, promised to bear fruitful findings from the research. And again, focused on this idea of smoking being an efficient form of self-medication and if that was shown in his research, that it would be a significant bonus for the tobacco industry. Um, the industry reviewed the proposal and said that the individual has been completely dependent on them for funding, has a long friendly relationship with the tobacco industry, and they did decide to fund the research. Um, when I do a literature research, you search to see if the work was published, it doesn't look like it's ever been published which makes me think that they didn't find those, those promising um, effects that they, that they promised to, to find. The next slide is an example of uh, work that was in, in messaging that was put out in the more popular media um, rather than scholarly work. And um, again, with this idea of promoting the idea that nicotine is out there for people to help themselves. Um, and the individual wasn't involved in research in mental health, um, but was heavily funded by the industry and then um, authored this article that appeared in Chemistry and Industry. And then the next slide is an example, um, the next slide is an example of um, the tobacco industry has a long history of um, providing cigarettes in uh, mental health settings, so psychiatric uh, hospital settings. Um, this one was a request from the hospital to RJ Reynolds asking for a donation of 12,000 cigarettes uh, at Christmas time to give to their patients. Uh, and so very kind of unusual um, to have a hospital setting where you're um, not only permitting smoking, but giving cigarettes. Um, you know, you, you just wouldn't see that in a general hospital, but a very different standard in psychiatric hospitals in the US. And those are just a few examples. If, if you're kind of interested in, in this work, I definitely encourage you um, to see that article in Schizophrenia Bulletin from 2008, because it gives much more detail. Okay, so now we will shift to the, to the mental health settings. And I really like this quote um, from Dr. Chambers, which asks, how is it that our mental health research and clinical communities focus so exclu exclusively on beneficial effects of smoking in populations who suffer the most from it? Okay, so I won't spend a ton of time um, on it, but individuals with mental illness much more likely to die of, to of cancers, um, tobacco-related cancers, lung disease, like chronic obstructive um, pulmonary disease, um, to, to die from heart disease related to smoking. So very much um, great disparities uh, in, in related to tobacco disease and death in this population. Um, and so that's why it's so important to address tobacco. The next slide um, also raises the issue that not only is primary smoking so deadly uh, to the individual, but the secondhand smoke is also very harmful to those around the individual. Um, and so if you have and allow smoking in a hospital setting, other patients are being exposed, staff members are being exposed, and even 
uh, when a setting goes perhaps smoke-free inside, but allows smoking just outside the building, uh, you can see here from, from the science I'm showing here uh, that you still get very high level uh, exposures to the um, carcinogens and secondhand smoke. Um, so with this figure, you see the highest, the red bar, oh, we'll go back. The highest, the red bar, um, if smoking is allowed in a smoking room, um, and then the orange, if smoking is allowed in, in a communal area, um, the yellow, if it, there's indoor um, with smoking rooms, um, the green, if smoking is outside, um, you still get um, uh, particulate matter at levels that is concerning for health. And it's only when you've got complete indoor, outdoor uh, smoking bans that you've got the best protection. Okay, the next slide. Uh, this map shows you how well the U.S. is doing in terms of having complete indoor-outdoor smoking bans at mental health treatment settings. Um, and the darker blue uh, would indicate that more places are, are covered. They have um, clean air bans, um, clean, clean air policies. And you can see with the U.S. that for the most part, it's uh, the light shaded blue or even the white. Um, so we, we are not necessarily a leader in going smoke free, um, just that some states have, have, done, have done better than others. And then the next slide. And this shows you that a minority of U.S. mental health treatment settings uh, attend to tobacco, that is, ask about smoking, um, provide treatment, and so forth. Um, so we're still not at 50%, um, even in the U.S., um, to have a tobacco ban, to screen for tobacco, uh, to provide cessation counseling, nicotine replacement therapy, or other prescription medications. The next slide. And you might think that, well, if a, if a facility goes smoke-free, then they must be really good at addressing tobacco. And, and that would be the ideal, that you pair a, a smoke-free policy uh, with availing treatment to patients. Um, and you can see here that still, um, if, if you do have a smoke-free facility, only 43% are counseling uh, to quit smoking. Uh, just about a third are providing nicotine replacement therapy, and only a quarter are providing other cessation medications. Okay, next slide. And I've um, done some research over the years looking at inpatient psychiatry settings. Um, one of the first questions I had was, well, if you have patients and they're hospitalized for like a week uh, in a smoke-free environment, uh, what happens to their smoking when they leave that hospital? And um, this hospital was a, in the forefront for going smoke-free, might even be the first in the US, um, but was not doing much with regard to, to treatment, uh, and particularly when the patient left. And what I found, and you, you see this kind of ski slope uh, in the graph, is that everybody returned to smoking upon leaving the hospital, and nearly everybody returned to smoking that same day. It's like a median of five minutes. Um, so patients were effectively lighting up on the sidewalk outside the hospital after, after leaving. And so it got me thinking, uh, how do we help patients kind of can take that, that, that learning, you know, that experience of being smoke-free and um, shift that to help them stay smoke-free once they leave the hospital. Um, so the next slide. Um, and I also was curious, so what are the environments like for the patients outside of the hospital? Um, because again, it's like a, a one week stay uh, and then they're gonna go back to where they live, be it their own home or like a group home. Um, and so this graph, it, it's a map um, that shows the density of tobacco retailers around where the people live. And each dot is a patient in our study. Um, the white circles are um, like a group home, like a communal. So more than one person from our study lived there. And the shading shows um, the density of tobacco retailers, so stores that sell tobacco. And what we found is that our patients who have serious mental illness in our study, um, their environments were twice as dense with tobacco retailers uh, relative to the general um, population in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then we also found that the closer the density, the, 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 the closer the tobacco retailers to where they live, the greater the number of tobacco retailers around them was related to um, lower readiness to quit smoking, um, greater dependence on nicotine, 
Um, so again, kind of you know, getting an understanding of how the environment can affect behavior. The next slide. Now, in terms of treatment providers in the US, um, we see when, when we surveyed, um, people surveyed psychiatrists um, that a majority ask about tobacco use um, and advise patients to quit, um, but less than half were assessing readiness to quit and less than a quarter were providing assistance, were providing treatment. Um, this study also found that psychiatrists were the least likely to address tobacco compared to other medical specialties like family medicine, internal medicine, or obstetrics and, and gynecology. That was asking the mental health providers. Um, we did a study where we asked patients um, and um, individuals specifically with bipolar disorder who smoke and very few reported that a psychiatrist, therapist or case manager ever advised them to quit smoking. And some even shared that their mental health provider had actually encouraged them um, to keep um, smoking or to not try to quit because they were worried about their mental health and how that would be affected. And then this next uh, study is a meta-analysis. So it's combining data um, from a number of surveys that were done. Uh, the next slide. And um, so it's over 16,000 mental health providers. And just some general findings is that many providers um, believe that people with mental illness don't want to quit. Um, the providers, many have permissive attitudes towards smoking, don't see it as, as such a big deal, um, see a lot of barriers to treating smoking uh, for themselves, um, have negative attitudes towards quitting smoking, like maybe don't think it'll, it'll work. Um, and then over a third think that quitting um, smoking is too stressful for these patients. Um, so those are some of the barriers that can come up. Um, and so that's kind of some of the, what we looked at to see if these beliefs, um, do they hold true? Can patients with mental illness quit? Um, can they quit without it being too stressful for them? Uh, might it even improve their mental health recovery? And that's some of the work that we've been looking at. So the next slide, uh, when we ask patients themselves, are you ready to quit smoking? Uh, what we see is that their profile in terms of readiness to quit looks just as, as it looks just the same as people in the general population. So whether they're, you know, patients we surveyed in psychiatric outpatient clinics, whether they specifically had depression, uh, whether they were surveyed in psychiatric inpatient settings, or even here uh, among uh, methadone clients, um, their readiness to quit looked just like the general population. And you see just about um, half um, saying that they're ready to quit in the next six months and about a quarter or more saying that they're ready to quit in the next month. So it's very uh, much more hopeful uh, in terms of hearing that um, patients are, are interested in treatment for their smoking. Yeah, and then we don't see any relationship between severity of symptoms um, and their readiness to quit. It's not, oh, they're too severe, don't offer treatment. Um, and some patients um, who I've worked with have said, you know, I've been told don't quit, you're too stressed. And, and she said, but I'm always, you know, I've always had stress. Uh, so there may not be that, that perfect window of time um, in their lives to, to try to quit. And as a result, you know, they get chronic exposure to the harms of smoking. Um, so really listening to the patient and asking, how do they feel? Maybe they are ready, even though you might feel that um, it might be too much. Next slide. And then another reason to address tobacco in um, patients with mental illness is because uh, the smoke, and it's really important to know it's, it's the smoke, the tars that go into the liver, not the nicotine, um, for these effects, it's the smoke and the tars in the liver induce the metabolism of, of a number of psychiatric medications. And what I mean by that is that it speeds the metabolism. Um, so it reduces the blood levels of a number of psychiatric medications. Um, so for some meds like olanzapine, um, it's like 90% uh, reduced in, in the blood levels. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're treating patients in the hospital, and they, don't, they are not smoking, being mindful of that. But then also 
when you're helping patients quit, um, being mindful that they may not need as high of these antipsychotics, which could be a good thing too. Um, we do also see this with caffeine. Um, and so if your patients um, drink a lot of, of coffee or other caffeinated beverages, um, advising them to reduce that while they're quitting smoking, um, because otherwise they may feel really amped up, um, feel like they're climbing the walls and it's from caffeine overload rather than say nicotine withdrawal. How about this question of, well, is it too stressful to quit? Um, there's a really nice uh, meta-analysis done, again, a review of the literature and a quantitative review. And what they found is that quitting smoking is associated with long-term reductions in depression, anxiety, and stress, and improved positive mo mood states um, and quality of life, including among those with poor mental health. Um, so, you know, if you, uh, yes, the initial period can be stressful, um, particularly the first three days um, and withdrawal symptoms last about two to um, about two to four weeks. But if you can get your patient through that and there are medications to help them get through that, you can see that their mood actually can improve. Their anxiety can come down. Um, their quality of life can, can, can get better um, relative to how they continue to smoke. Okay. Now the next slide, we're gonna get into the literature. So some randomized control trial data um, to see the evidence again for, can you be successful in helping patients quit? And also some um, looking at whether does that hurt their mental health recovery if they quit smoking? Um, I will give the disclaimer that while we know a ton about helping people quit smoking, over 8,000, probably over 10,000 now studies, randomized controlled trials in the general population. Um, many of these studies exclude people with mental illness, um, viewing them as, as too complicated. Um, and so there's actually like less than 30 randomized controlled trials focused on those with mental illness. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I will give you a sense of, of some of the findings. Um, what is optimistic is that the literature is growing in this area. Um, this was a, a biblio um, uh, review um, that it was a mentor uh, for um, that was done in Australia, but looked at the full um, literature. And you can see that um, the overall literature is growing for, with a focus on tobacco in those with mental illness uh, and including the number of randomized controlled trials, which is the red uh, sliver in the bar there. Next slide. Um, in the US, and, I, and I, I think in Brazil as well, um, quit line services are a, a way to deliver treatment to kind of the whole population at um, free to the individual, a uh, toll-free number in the US. And what we see is that um, it works for the general population. It also works for those with depression, um, although we see a little bit lower quit rates. So 19% quit if they had depression compared to 28% without depression. Uh, so still that's good and some people quit just a lower quit rate um, for those with depression. The next slide was a study that compared the standard quit line uh, to a quit line that would be tailored to people with mental health concerns. Um, so it included some marketing and proactive outreach. Um, it had uh, medication coordination. Uh, so attention to the, to the mental health concerns of the patients that went beyond what the standard quit line provides. Uh, and what we see is that the quit rates were enhanced. So 26% with the telequit mental health line uh, compared to 18% in the standard quit line. Now this next slide is um, from work that I've done in the inpatient psych unit. Um, it was fairly low contact intervention, computer delivered. Um, they get a computer printout um, tailored to their readiness to quit. They didn't have to want to quit smoking to be in the study. Um, they met with us briefly on the unit uh, and they got the nicotine patch from us on the unit and for when they left the hospital. Uh, average length of stay was a week and we met with them again at three months, six months and 12 months offering treatment each time and then a final assessment at 18 months. And the dark blue line is the treatment group and it was 20% quit rate at 18 months compared to about 8% in the usual care group. 
Uh, so significant improvement in quitting. Um, and it was not just self-reported, but also with a breath sample. And then further, we saw that there was fewer rehospitalizations among those in the treatment group. So it's not that we had done any harm uh, to their mental health recovery by offering them these treatment services over time. And as you can see, it is pretty low cost, um, under $500 uh, per quality adjusted life year in US dollars. Okay, the next slide. A postdoctoral fellow of mine took that intervention to our county hospital in San Francisco, which is a much more ethnically diverse um, patient population. And um, you can see here that we um, kind of paralleled, saw, saw similar uh, rates of success with quitting smoking, again, with the treatment group outperforming the usual care. Um, and this patient population more likely to be unhoused, um, to be uh, non-white, uh, and to be of low income. The next slide. Uh, another uh, uh, mentee of mine looked at um, in the same sample, but among those with dual diagnosis, uh, so using uh, substances um, at a level of abuse, uh, and found again that we, we still achieved a significant effect with quitting smoking in the treatment group compared to usual care. Um, so having mental illness plus alcohol or drug dependence, um, those patients also successful with quitting smoking. Next slide. Now I'm gonna take you to like our next study, which is in, in the three, well, four hospitals, um, three hospitals, sorry, and nearly a thousand patients. And we added a more extended treatment to see if we could outperform uh, what we did with that more brief intervention, um, including giving six months of combination nicotine replacement therapy. Uh, so patch plus gum or lozenge. And we also wanted to see whether the quit rates would differ by psychiatric diagnosis because there haven't been many studies to look at that. Uh, so next slide. Um, in the hospital, most people accepted nicotine replacement therapy from us. Um, so you know, 87%. After hospitalization, um, most treatment participants opted to get the nicotine replacement therapy from us, 88%. The next slide. Yep. And then um, if they got the NRT requested from us, they were more likely to make a 24 hour quit attempt, the 54%. Uh, and they were more likely to be quit at one week post hospitalization. So again, we're trying to shift that, that ski slope and try to save some of those people so that they don't go back to smoking when they leave hospital. And then, the next, yep, this slide. Uh, and what we found is that the treatment groups, be it the brief or the extended, uh, about 20% quit at 18 months um, compared to 12.5% in the usual care. And that was a significant difference. Um, this study too, people didn't have to want to quit smoking to, to, to join. Uh, and so the idea that we're engaging people, uh, helping more people quit smoking over time, and again, reaching that 20%. Uh, the next slide shows by different uh, diagnostic categories uh, and no real difference. Um, so it's not like, like those with schizophrenia did worse than those with unipolar depression. Um, the group that was the lowest in our study was bipolar, those who had bipolar disorder. And then this is just a summary. Um, it's that we've done this kind of work in, in, in outpatient settings with people with depression. We've done a series of studies in the inpatient psych setting. And then this work has been done in the general population. And what we see are very similar quit rates. Uh, so it doesn't look like those with serious mental illness um, are at a disadvantage uh, or, or less likely to quit with these treatments. Um, they get just as much help and benefit uh, from them. Okay, now I'm gonna leave my lab and um, Miles McFall's group um, with the Veterans Administration uh, Medical Center has done really neat uh, creative work to integrate tobacco treatment into PTSD care. Uh, so care for post-traumatic stress disorder. And so instead of referring patients out to the quit smoking clinic, they address tobacco within the therapy groups uh, for PTSD. And what they found is they doubled the likelihood of quitting uh, by doing that, integrating rather than referring. Um, and that they increased receipt of medications for quitting smoking, 
increased counseling sessions, and then again, also increased the quitting rate, uh, and that it was found to be cost effective. Uh, further, that quitting smoking had no detriment on their PTSD symptoms. Okay, this colorful figure, uh, this, these are data on um, comparing uh, varenicline or, or Champix uh, to bupropion uh, or Welbutrin or Zyban, however it's called, um, uh, to the patch in the purple bar. And then the orange red bar is um, placebo. And there's different diagnostic categories there people with psychotic disorder, people with anxiety disorder, and people with mood disorders. Uh, in every group, uh, Champix was the leader, um, but also bupropion and um, patch outperformed placebo. So those are the quit rates in the, in the top series of, of bars. And then the underneath that are the likelihood of um, adverse events. And this is kind of a, a mixed bag of adverse events because uh, the adverse event rates were very low. Um, and what you see is that treating with cessation of medications doesn't increase the likelihood of these serious adverse events. Um, so these medications, again, are very helpful for helping patients with mental illness to quit smoking. And it doesn't look like they um, cause any harm in terms of serious adverse events uh, greater than what you would see with a placebo. And then the next slide um, was a study that shows if you take Champix and you do it longer, so rather than three months, you go, uh, in this case, even after 52 weeks, um, that you reduce relapse. Um, so you optimize the success of long-term quitting smoking. And this was a study done with people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. All right. And then the last medication side, uh, meta-analysis, and that was done and found um, that patients with schizophrenia are benefited with the use of uh, Zyban or bupropion um, for quitting smoking, and that there's a greater than twofold increase in likelihood of being tobacco free at six months if they get the medication compared to placebo. And it's actually even a stronger effect than what we see in the general population. And that's largely because if you give patients with schizophrenia a placebo, uh, very few of them quit smoking on their own. Um, so really the importance of having medication available. Okay, going more kind of public health um, uh, focus, uh, doing media, public media campaigns can be a, a wonderful way to engage people into treatment. Um, this was a study I did with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where they created an ad campaign um, with Rebecca, who was a former tobacco user, um, and she had depression. And so it used her as kind of a, a role model um, for individuals to talk about success with quitting smoking and improvements in her mood from quitting smoking. Um, this ad campaign was found to be particularly helpful uh, among people who reported having mental illness in the general population. All right, and then we'll continue with some, some again, more public health policy, um, increasing the price of cigarettes. Um, that's been known for years, decades, to help um, prevent kids from taking up smoking. Uh, and then this study showed that, um, that patients or people with mental illness, um, they are price sensitive. So raising the cost of cigarettes uh, can, can increase the likelihood of quitting smoking among people with mental health conditions. And the next slide looked at um, taking places smoke-free. I understand Brazil has, has done wonderful work in, in going smoke-free in, in, indoors. Um, and so if you get restaurants and bars to go tobacco-free, um, that increased the likelihood of quitting smoking among men with alcohol use disorders, women with anxiety disorders. Um, and in this study, it didn't show an effect for people with mood disorders, um, but you know, some nice effects with the other two groups. All right, and then we'll go back to the agent. What if we go back to that cigarette and have the ability to regulate, um, to change its design so that it's not, a, oh, get rid of that. So that it's not addictive? Uh, and this is some um, work that's being done in the US with a lot of different groups, including studies that have been done among people with mental illness. And what they found is that if you give people cigarettes that are very low in nicotine content, 
So what's actually in the rod of the cigarette, that it's less than half of um, a milligram of nicotine per gram of tobacco. Um, so it, you can't suck harder and get more out of it. It's just you know limited to what's in the rod. Um, it's found to be less reinforcing than regular cigarettes. Um, and this was done with people with comorbid substance use and addictive disorders. Uh, the studies see that people reduce their smoking, they smoke fewer cigarettes, uh, they report less dependence on the cigarettes, and we don't see that they're smoking more of the cigarettes. So in, in terms of a regulatory approach, uh, this could be a, a way to help people quit smoking generally, and um, looks like it would help people with mental illness to quit smoking. All right, so last slide. So why the high prevalence, near last slide, why the high prevalence of smoking in those with mental illness? Uh, is it the diagnosis, the host? Is it the product, the agent? Is it the targeted market, marketing that's done, the vector? Or is it the environment? Yes to all of those. Is it the failure to treat? Yes as well. Is it inevitable? No. So there are things that can be done in the treatment setting, at the policy level, and I leave you with a couple thoughts on that. Um, so some action points on the next slide. Uh, adopting smoke-free air laws in mental health treatment settings, as well as in bars and restaurants. Incorporating tobacco treatment in mental health professional training. And there's a curriculum I've helped develop called Prescription for Change or Rx for Change that has materials available for free. Uh, to treat tobacco use in frontline mental health staff so that they are tobacco free to integrate tobacco cessation into mental health treatment so that it's part of groups and other treatments uh, and to prohibit tobacco retailers near mental health treatment settings. Um, so no tobacco retailer within 500 feet, for example, or a thousand feet. Next one, last slide. Um, and then um, to create counter marketing, to create the new norm like the Rebecca ad, uh, to conduct inclusive tobacco treatment research and to report on subgroup effects in people with mental illness so that they are represented in the research. To integrate mental health consults within quit lines. To raise tobacco taxes so that the cost is higher. And lastly, to reduce nicotine to minimally or non-addictive levels. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the translation. Um, and I'm glad to take any questions. Thank you so, so much, Jody. I hope, oh, it's one hour and 16. Do you need to go? It's okay, I'm glad. It's okay. So let's open the chat. Um, let's see. Well, no, only congrats mm -hmm. and message of thanks. Um, now, Stella, uh, loving Stella. Stella is such a lovely uh, person and active uh, in this cause, like you, just like she remembers you. And she says, congratulations, are our vaping addicts already seeking treatment at your service? How best to take a vaping history? Great, great question. And I was asking um, Carol earlier about, before we started about um, the status of e-cigarettes in Brazil. Uh, we do see people um, who come to us with addiction to nicotine vaping. And we do engage them in, in our um, clinical service um, group work as well as individual work. Um, so it is a thing. Many of them are adults who smoked cigarettes and then switched um, to say Juul um, and then had a hard time quitting Juul and, and, and wanting to do so. So we work with them. Um, in the US, medications are not FDA approved yet um, for, for treating vaping, but um, our patients have been smokers and then vapors, so our clinicians have been comfortable, um, the psychiatrists, with using medications um, to help them quit vaping. And then um, we do standard you know, cognitive behavioral, motivational, mindfulness approaches. Um, okay. In terms of how to take a vaping history, um, definitely getting asking what's the product that they're using because there's so many products out there. Uh, what flavor are they using? 
uh, what nicotine level is the product, um, and then getting a sense of um, how often they're vaping, um, time to first hit with the vape in the morning as an indicator of addiction, uh, and then how many vaping sessions and how long are those vaping sessions uh, to get a sense of the quantity of exposure and then their readiness to quit. Oh, good. Excellent. And Hello. Are you hearing me? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. May, may, I, may I ask some questions? Sure. Please. First, be an honor. thank you very much, Judith, for being with us today. And uh, I would like to, to make a question from Marvin Pereira. He is watching us from YouTube and he is asking about uh, uh, the importance of treat also the, the health professional. And I would like to hear you about the experience that you have been all these years uh, treating uh, psychiatric patients Uh, but also the people uh, that take care of them? Yes, great question. Really important um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one being, if you are taking your setting smoke-free, you want to support your, your employees, your staff, your team, as well as the patients. And going smoke-free should be viewed um, as something that's to support health and not punitive. Um, so rather than taking away that you're giving treatment to help in that process. Um, in the work I've done, the hospitals have been smoke-free, um, but we've had clinicians come up to us when they've heard about the study and say, oh, hey, hey, could I have some information? And we've given them the manuals. We've given them you know, information about medications. Um, so really, really glad to support that. Um, When I've worked with settings looking to go smoke-free, um, we've talked about, again, having the treatment come before the policy um, to be supportive. Um, in the clinic that we do at Stanford for quitting smoking, we also offer treatment to family members. So the extent to which that might be possible, uh, also really valuable because the patients will go home um, to their families. Um, So yeah, I, I would just say, you know, it, you could do groups with, with staff if, if they feel comfortable. Um, you could pair them as buddies um, and then absolutely making uh, like nicotine replacement therapy, other medications available. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You also could do bonuses, uh, incentivizing quitting uh, for staff has been shown to be very effective as well. Have you done it? Have you? had the opportunity? I've taken part in studies where we pay. We're actually just launching one right now in Alaska um, where we will pay um, the participants and a family member for supporting. Um, I personally haven't done the, the staff model, but I, that would be really neat to, to do, yeah. And what about the, the ones that don't smoke and uh, don't receive the extra the, the mm -hmm. support? Yeah, How do yeah. you deal with that? Yes. Um, so one idea is to pay for other behavior changes that are health supporting. Um, you know, just about everybody has at least one risk factor. So if it's dietary or exercise or sleep, you know, so you could broaden it um, if you felt like everybody needs to benefit in some way. Sure. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, At all. We have a, some other questions. Sure. No, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, eh, Dr. Guilherme, uh, do you think we should ban um, retail tobacco stores around schools, like health, like um, in health services? I mean, prohibition on the neighborhood because here we have a huge market. Uh, illicit market that is forcing to regulate uh, e-cigarette that since 2009 is, is forbidden the, the retail, uh, the, the, the commerce, the, the, to buy, to, to sell. So they give the people in the streets, in, in the parties, um, in the uh, beaches, and, and then 
you know, it's kind of growing strong, but we are trying to uh, organize something to uh, start that that wave that Guilherme is so, uh, sold. And so basically, um, is it important to um, watch, be watchful around schools? Absolutely. Um, so yes, so to prevent um, uptake of tobacco use and all the point of sale marketing that happens in retailers uh, in the US and you know, in other countries, because you can't have ads on TV or on the radio for tobacco, uh, the dollars are put into the retail. And so um, signs on, on the doors um, and at the when you go to purchase and price promotions, uh, so keeping that away from environments that children are frequenting, uh, like near their schools, um, that is, that's a very common policy at the local level in the U.S., um, like not within, uh, I know I'm saying feet, but like 500 meters or, or a, a thousand or a kilometer uh, from schools um, is, is a great way. Um, another effort is to put tobacco only in um, adult stores. Uh, so uh, age 21 and up uh, in the U.S. so that kids won't see it at, at the convenience store or, or any other kind of store. I remember back in 2016 that you, you said um, the advertisements were the size, the high, um, yeah. the same high as your daughter, as your little daughter, like for kids to see it so and they say it's not for kids it's for people who tries to stop and can't but it's more of an in initiation thing sandra that is very active and the coordinator uh, of the tobacco treatment in sao paulo uh is asking is actually is saying that our treatment it's it's not uh about quick lines but on primary health care. We have free primary health care uh, treatment uh, via SUS, that is our United, like, like NHS, but mm -hmm. from Brazil. And what do you think about qualifying these teams in the um, management of patients? And um, get, uh, chronic mental conditions to get better in these services yeah. too. Uh, it would be a change in the, the model of attention because um, there is this thing that uh, not, not everyone can prescribe. Of course, um, the NRT, the nicotine replacement therapy, everyone can prescribe, the propion, it's uh, dentists can prescribe and it kind of uh, gets a funnel, you know, it's, it's straight in a little and the access to treatment gets worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So great question. And um, so that taking that population, if, if you've got care accessible to primary care, uh, that is ideal because you've got the volume and ideally they they know how to treat tobacco. So it's filling in any gap on the mental health side. So what you don't want is these providers to feel, well, these patients are too complicated or I, I fear they will decompensate if I take away um, their cigarettes. And so um, any training needs and support that would be needed to provide those frontline providers so that they feel comfortable and know the, the data that you know you can help patients with mental illness quit. Mm -hmm. um, in the US, when I worked with psychiatrists in training, I often heard, oh, that's for the primary care doc. That, that, that's not for psychiatry. Um, and then you may have primary care docs who say, oh, this patient's not for me, they're for psychiatrists. And the so you, same. Yeah, so you don't want them to be left with, well, where do I go? Ideally, that both systems, any door that they walk in could provide treatment. Yeah. And um, Stella, again, uh, from USP, uh, she, she asks, drug treatment is not approved for vaping, like you said, but what is your experience? Do you prefer NRT, bupropion, or varenicline? Hmm. Varenicline is that in the world, right? <laughs> it's kind of 
<laughs> well, yeah. it's available it, generically. Oh, we, really? In the yeah. United States? Here in Brazil? No, we oh, don't yeah. have. We are orphans. So I'm on sabbatical this year, and I've been working with the World Health Organization. And so we've been working with some pharmaceutical companies to look at global access to cessation medications and affordable global access. Um, so there is Cipro, I believe is the company, one of the companies, but there are companies very interested in, in providing um, generic, but I hear you, maybe it's not reached and certainly hasn't reached everywhere. Um, Unfortunately, because in psychiatry, it helped a lot because the self-efficacy of the, the, the person depressed or, or with psychotic disorder was kind of hard to engage in a, a stopping date, like a quit date, uh, schedule a quit date. And, mm -hmm. and with Veronica, I, I don't receive anything <laughs> from Pfizer, okay? Let me clear this up. Uh, but uh, it would be a mismatch, a good mismatch, like, whoa, I'm not into smoking anymore. I can't smoke, but you know, it's easier. So, and it was um, this surprise that I, I felt like uh, would be make things easier and uh, get them with faith to stop. I don't know what is yep, your impression. Yep. No, yeah, definitely. And then how about isidazine available or not? not yet? Probably in Brazil. Yeah. So that's zero. Yeah. So there are some studies being underway to look at NRTs for, for quitting um, e-cigarettes. There was one that used um, veronicline and e-cigarettes to quit smoking, um, but then also cytosine uh, to quit vaping. Um, you know, it's so cytosine. early. It's so early in the research that I wouldn't say this mad is best for quitting vaping, um, but just how important it is to have as many tools in your toolbox as a clinician. And it is unfortunate that one tool right now is not available, the, the Chantix. Um, but in our clinic, some patients don't want any more NRT, or they might feel the NRT doesn't get the hit as quickly as the e-cigarette. So having like, you know, Champix or um, Bupropion, uh, Verniclean as, a, as an alternative, you know, a, a treatment is, is helpful. Yeah. Oh my God, what a problem. Yeah. It's like Phoenix, right? Now they research like, more powerful but we will fight the good fight let's go <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much jody absolutely i i don't know if we have uh youtube questions ali uh, no okay so we we took a lot of our t of your time. You said one hour and it's one hour and a half. And I would be here like three hours talking to you because you know so much and you're so um, easy to talk to. Thank you so, so much. It's been a pleasure. And I hope this is just the beginning of our, of our partnership because we want you by, by our side so we can change lives of people with mental, mental illness. Oh, well, thank you so much for inviting me and for the wonderful questions. I'm so thrilled to be with you on World No Tobacco Day and would be thrilled to continue to help the work that you're doing in Brazil. So thank you. Thank you. Obrigada, gente. Muito obrigada mesmo. <laughs> Tá? Tomara que essa palestra assim, se difunda, porque é muito importante. A gente sempre esquece dos exilados, dos marginalizados na sociedade. Eu tenho a teoria, né, particularmente, que é estigma velado, assim, com aquelas pessoas que né, ó, não incomoda não, morre precocemente, tudo bem, aceita. E a gente precisa ser a voz deles. Né? Então, eu, eu martelo o, a saúde mental, o tratamento do tabagismo é central, não é periférico. Ele pode melhorar a depressão, a ansiedade, como a, a Judite colocou muito bem aqui, embasada em literatura científica séria. Então, lembrem-se disso. Quando forem falar para os pacientes, expliquem para ele que a qualidade, tanto a qualidade de vida como a saúde mental vai melhorar demais. É central, não é periférico. Não é só dar um remédio para melhorar a depressão, a ansiedade ou o quadro psicótico. Você precisa também explicar para ele que é importante parar de fumar. Faz parte do tratamento. 
Carol, queria também agradecer a nossa tradutora, né? Sim, Elaine, que esteve muito. aí nos, nos bastidores. E, Essencial. Ó, obviamente, ela não é uma tradutora por profissão, mas aceitou o desafio. E eu espero, né, Elaine, que você esteja ainda viva e tranquila, né, nervosa, e nos acompanhe em outros eventos como esse, tá bom? Então, obrigada. Foi um a todos. prazer, gente. <risos>